Demographic changes stemming from birth rates, an aging population, and immigration affect the economy as well as our legislative and congressional representation. Minnesota State Demographer Susan Brower joins me to talk about where we are as a state as we prepare for the upcoming 2020 census. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Since we began our conversations with you three years ago about the changing demographics in Minnesota, you warned of the tsunami of aging baby boomers. Since then, are we better positioned today to address the growing pressures as this aging population continues to move through our demographics? I would say that people have kind of come to an understanding that this is happening, but I think we're still working toward what it means and how to respond and how to prepare. We're still very much in that spot where we're understanding kind of what it means as the age wave unfolds in front of us. And right now we're starting to feel it in our employment situation, particularly in the availability of workers for the jobs that we have. Um, employers are starting to respond differently to that need in particular, but I think we have a whole host of other kind of impacts that we have to continue to prepare for going forward. So mo more work for all different agencies of government to kind of continue to adjust to this new reality. Absolutely, and I would also say that in addition to kind of just the differences on the ground, we will continue to feel changes in the public budgets due to some of these demographic shifts. It really does mean more demand all around and how state government reacts to that more, that higher demand for services is going to be something that affects all agencies across the board, not just DHS or MDH. Okay, yeah. well, let's f pause for a moment because Maine just crossed a major threshold. Um, a, when a fifth of a population is age 65 or older, it meets the definition of super aged according to the World Bank. Many states are expected to follow in coming years. Do you happen to know when Minnesota will reach this milestone? You know, I don't have that number in my head, but I can kind of tell you where we are with respect to the aging trend generally. The first baby boomers began turning age 65 in 2011. It's a 20 year generation, so we're already 10, almost 10 years into this transition. And we meet a major milestone this year in 2019 where we will have more older adults, age 65 and above, than we have school-aged children. And that really is something that the state has never experienced before. Other states, Maine for example, uh, have had this shift, but for Minnesota this is the first time that we have ever had more older adults than school-aged kids. It's significant because if you look at our public, our state budget, uh, a significant proportion goes to K-12 education, a significant proportion goes to health and human services uh, that are related to the care of the elderly. And it really does mean, as I said earlier, increasing budget pressures all around. This is, as I said, 10 years into a transition that's expected to last 20 years or longer. Um, and so it does mean mounting budget pressures over the next one to two decades. We're just at a point right now where we, we reach that milestone of, of more older adults than school-age kids. One other aspect of this is uh, it's been in effect across the state, including rural areas, but you know, we, have a, we have a growing immigrant population, yeah. but we also have challenges for affordable housing for uh, rental and home ownership. Yeah. Does it appear to you, and there's even a select committee working on that right now here in the Senate, but does it appear to you that policymakers are beginning to understand what is needed for the state to continue to thrive in terms of all of these different challenges of, of demographics and immigration and aging and lack of employment or lack of employable people, actually. Yeah, I mean, I think the focus has shifted somewhat from um, the, the uh, jobs, the, the um, creation of jobs, and people are starting to focus on the things that support the people for the jobs. And so, as you said, housing is one of those things. Child care is one of those things. And so I think we're starting to see kind of what it means to have a policy shift in the direction of um, supporting the number of workers, whether it's for new Americans, new Minnesotans, or for our younger generation who have, who have come up here in Minnesota. 
So let's turn to the census now. I remember you once mm -hmm. said that uh, census time is like Christmas for a demographer. <laughs> um, what is being done here in Minnesota to prepare for the census? Fortunately, a lot is being done. Uh, we've been working on this for a couple of years here at the Department of Administration. We're working with cities and counties to set up specific um, complete count committees, which are volunteer committees that figure out just how to promote the census in the local area. Um, we're also doing a lot of promotional activities. We're working with the Minnesota Council on Foundations, the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits, um, to try to kind of blanket all the networks that we can reach through all the networks that we possibly can to promote the importance of the census before it arrives in people's mailbox in mid-March uh, 2020. According to the Washington Post, Minnesota is expected to lose a congressional seat this time around. Based on your knowledge, is that likely to happen? So based on the most recent projections, it really could go either way. And I'm not just saying that as a Minnesotan, you look at those numbers and it gives us a margin of about 30,000 in either direction. So the most recent projections looking at this say we could lose a seat or we could keep a seat. And when you have that margin of about 30,000, that means it could come down to just one count. So it's very, very close, just like it was in 2010. You may recall in 2010, we got the very last congressional seat and we got it by about 8,000 people. We're back in that same position right today. So I would challenge those numbers just based on what I've seen recently. We've had a little growth of, uh, a little spurt of growth in the last couple of years. And I think if that continues, we really are in a good position, <clears throat> excuse me, we really are in a good position to potentially keep that seat. Uh, there are many barriers and challenges in conducting a national census. And I understand that this census will rely heavily on technology with people completing their forms um, online. Are there concerns about hacking or disinformation with this new online availability for the census? There are, and those are things that the Census Bureau is working to plan for. Um, I would say that because, again, because it's the first digital census, these are new concerns, but there's a wealth of knowledge across the federal government in cybersecurity, um, and in um, disinformation. But these are things that are definitely on their radar and that, that they'll be working to uh, w working against and that here locally we can also um, help support that. If we see um, information that looks not quite right, uh, we can check it out. We can ask, is this, is this really um, a trusted uh, source of information? Having an accurate count is important for a number of reasons, including congressional district distribution and legislative district distribution. How do you address those people who are wary of the census, either because they are a loved one, is here illegally, or they just don't have trust of the government, they don't think the government needs this information? What do you say to people who fear this census? Well, first, we acknowledge that those are real fears in many cases. Uh, we work through trusted partners to make sure that they already have a relationship with the people who are telling them about the census. But probably most importantly, we explain to people why the census is important. So if they understand that this is how we fund our communities, this is how we make our schools better for our children, this is how we decide where hospitals go, it begins to be kind of less of a personal act and more of an act of the community. And I've found that that resonates for a lot of people, whether they have a fear of the government that is based kind of in the current political climate, or if it's a fear, just kind of a, a generalized disposition to uh, mistrust the government. And so that's what we are, um, those are the kind of things that we're talking about, again, through those trusted partners. So encouraging everyone to complete their census form. State demographer Susan Brower, it is always a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having me.